Welcome to Plato's Cave. I'm Jordan Myers, and I'm a master's student in philosophy at the University of Houston. You're listening to a reading group episode of the show, which means that in this episode, I discuss the paper Reply, The Free Will Revolution by John Martin Fisher with three non-philosopher friends, Adam, Giffen, and Brian, because philosophy shouldn't just be for philosophers. And so in this episode, we really do a continuation of the previous episode in the Moral Responsibility series. Uh, That paper was on semi-compatibilism by John Martin Fisher. And when we read that paper and discussed it, there were a few sort of outstanding questions that we all had. Um, And so uh, we decided to look at an earlier paper by uh, John Fisher and see if we could find any answers there. Um, Brian was not a part of the previous episode, but he did join us for this episode. So there's a little bit at the beginning of sort of um, going over uh, ground that we tread in the first paper. But if you found the previous episode interesting, uh, if you're interested in John Fisher's view or reasons responsive compatibilism generally, I think this episode is a really good one. And this clarified um, my understanding of reasons responsiveness, but also clarified sort of the relevant questions that I think are worth asking, um, which is always a good thing to do. So with that introduction, I hope that you enjoy our discussion of John Martin Fisher's work. Okay. And then the other thing I was thinking about, could we try this time? Because I feel like in our past podcasts, we get kind of bogged down on points. Mm. And it's great to discuss points in depth. But I think what happens a lot of times is we alienate points to the point where viewers don't really understand what we're talking about. <laughs> yes. So yes. I think it's really important that we just really try and be biased towards getting through the entire paper. So the entire scope is revealed and then diving into those smaller points. We can, I think, talk about those smaller points as they come up, but I don't I don't really want to dive into points too much yeah. until we've kind of seen the entire thing being fleshed out. I totally agree. Uh, and especially also, on this one, because I'm a, I'm a confused one on this paper, to be honest. I'm, a, I'm actually, I, actually, on that topic, I'm actually against going over the section of mm. the transfer of the final section. Yes, yes. I, 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 I Googled the definition, I read it, and I was going into one of the papers, and I'm like, this is actually like a whole area of philosophy we've never touched on. No. And he doesn't actually give a definition in the paper and just gives a critique. No. So I don't I don't want to, it's not even like we haven't, yeah, we just haven't really touched we just on don't, that, We don't so. have the credentials at this Yeah, point. I read his critique twice, but I'm like, I don't know, I, I don't know, I actually know. <laughs> the, <laughs> I don't know a damn thing about this. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, but that's, that would be my one area would be it's just a yes. short just a one page part of the paper that i think is worth not yes on. i so. i couldn't agree more with both uh inclinations there and also yeah. i i didn't i didn't realize this but this entire paper is a response to a symposium which is super cool because he so like well this plays into brian your whole thing about i have a lot of questions that's good you should and and like definitely be extremely liberal with asking them because Mm -hmm. I actually had forgotten too, that you missed the previous episode where we, yeah, (laughs) well, the previous episode, (laughs) let alone the entire, let alone the the beginning of the series. Yeah. I mean, that's what I can serve as as in in this episode though. Yeah, exactly. Questions. Yeah. Because, because for the other two, like I, 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 I would assume this is, this was a shared experience of yours where it's like, Oh wow. There were just kind of a lot of very interesting doors opened by this Um, because it was written in 2005, the title of it is Reply, the Free Will Revolution, and it's in Philosophical Explorations, um, but it was published in 2005. And then the paper that we read, which was itself sort of a summary, summarizing view of Fisher's work on semi-compatibilism was in 2012. Um, so we're actually reading an earlier paper, but the interesting thing about it is that it's in largely a reply to McKenna, Speak, Judish, and Shab- Shabo, Seth Shabo. Um, but yeah, so, yeah, so I think, I think the two sections that are actually super good is, are the first two for us to go over, um, the structure of semi-compatibilism and then, and then I I know we'll, I know we'll be talking a lot about the mechanism ownership part. Um, yeah, I, we're not going to jump the gun on that one, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So maybe what I should do is. 
Maybe I'll just <laughs> read the majority of the first paragraph because both for the listeners and for us, it gives a nice kind of review of the previous episodes slash review of just his overall position on this. Um, and then maybe even Brian, if you have any questions just based off of that, we yeah. can get them on the table. Yeah. yeah, basically just go and then I'll interject. Okay, nice. So um, it says, so I'm going to just quote from it. I have argued that moral responsibility does not require the sort of freedom or control that involves genuine metaphysical access to alternative possibilities, regulative regulative control. Rather, guidance control is the freedom-relevant condition necessary and sufficient for moral responsibility. When an individual controls his behavior in the pertinent way, he acts from a certain sort of general capacity for reasons responsiveness. A bit more specifically, an individual exhibits guidance control of his behavior insofar as it issues from his own moderately reasons responsive mechanism. On this sort of view, an agent need not have access to alternative paths into the future in order to be morally responsible. Uh, The relevance of what happens along non-actual pathways is to specify the modal or dispositional features of the general capacity in question. Semi-compatibilism holds that causal determinism is compatible with moral responsibility, quite apart from the issue of whether causal determinism is compatible with genuine metaphysical access to alternative possibilities. Um, Oh, I'll read the last line because it's, it's, it's nice. The future may or may not be a garden of forking paths in Borges' notable phrase. Nevertheless, we can legitimately be held morally responsible for how we take our own path into the future. I didn't okay. even know. It's cool that uh, Fisher likes Borges too. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Um, I, so, so quick couple definitions. Guidance control versus regulative control. I'm struggling to f- see the distinction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... This is a return to the previous episode, but it's worth reviewing because it's a, it's a really important distinction. So regulative control is the ability to do otherwise. So okay. in Frankfurt's terminology, it's the principle of alternative possibilities okay. um, or alternate possibilities. Um, so reg- regulative control is actually Borges's um, garden of forking paths is a good uh, illustration of it. So, The idea that you might have regulative control uh, is the idea that in your life, you know, there's a bunch of different pathways. There's all these possibilities. And if you have regulative control over yourself, you could freely choose to go down one path or another. It's this kind of it's like it's it's basically the notion that libertarians are endorsing with contra causal free will. Like I can override my deterministic background. Right. That makes sense. You can easily just deter. Yeah. Exactly. And Fisher does not think that we need that for moral responsibility. And I I don't think he thinks that we even have that. Right. So it's not now guidance control is, is different than that. And it's more sort of local. It is, um, I forget his exact, uh, you know, terminology that he uses in the 2012 paper, but it's basically the idea that you act in the world in such a way that you can manifest your intentions right? It's this sort of, um, it's basically kind of having um, like power over things in the world, right? So, so guidance control would be if I have the desire, the intention to turn my car left and I turn the wheel left and the car goes left, right? That's me exercising guidance control over the car. Um, Okay. So you're, it sounds, it's okay. It sounds like you're saying that like work, it's kind of, goes hand in hand with a determinist understanding of the world except that there is some sort of semblance of choice so it is it's compatible with a so you don't so determinism doesn't have to be false in order for you to have guidance control so basically um it doesn't matter that of course you know given the state of the universe if we like pressed pause and rewound it and then pressed play it again i would still make that left turn every time right right I don't have the alternate possibilities to make a right just because of determinism, but Mm -hmm. I exercise guidance control. If in fact I sort of have, you know, he he uses, I don't remember the language he uses, but it's sort of like local power over a situation. So for instance, like I couldn't make the car take off right. Like into the air. Like I just don't have the ability to do that. I don't have the guidance control over that, but I have the ability to make it turn left or right. And normally okay. I can do either of those things. Yeah. So are libertari- 
libertarians don't think that you can have the car take off though right <laughs> no no okay. i wasn't trying was try to imply that yeah the, the, i guess the, the, I, I i guess yeah <laughs> to me it was always yeah it, I, it, I guess. It, yeah it, it's just intention um aligning with actions your, your so, intentions get manifested yeah. yeah 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 so it's like um you know a libertarian might say okay you could have turned left or right at the light, but then a determinist would say you could have only turned right, but then under this model, it's not an issue if you could only have turned right because your intention was to turn right. So your guidance control indicates, or you had guidance control where okay. you know, behavior aligned with intention. Okay, so, so it sounds like you're deciding to go right, but you could have only decided to go right. That's what I'm hearing. Which sounds yes. like determinism. Yes. <clears throat> yes. So, and that's why they're compatible. It's like in the sense that um, it, it's not like, you know, behavior purely manifests outside of your intention. Like, like you're not going, if, if you intend like to like turn right, but then it, you know, the, the car turns left mm -hmm. and, um, I, I, let me actually rephrase that for a second there mm -hmm. because like say like in like a, a purely deterministic world um you had intended to turn the car right but the car turns left then or you turned the car left let's say you turned the car left but okay. your intention was to turn it right yeah well now behavior isn't a manifestation of intention mm -hmm. but you know, if you turn right and you had intended to turn right, even in a deterministic world where you could not have turned left, behavior at the very least does manifest uh, or intention does manifest in behavior. Okay. That is that, does, like, does that distinction make sense? That does there? make sense. Okay. 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 So it, it's, it's like an important nuance. Like um, it doesn't give you libertarian free will, but it, it's just that, there, yeah, there, it's still, it's, it sounds like it still says that there's a semblance of choice, even though you wouldn't have made another choice. Yes, exactly. Because it's like, okay. it's like there, there's at least that alignment between what you intended and how you behave. Okay. It, it, can, I, can I try to illustrate it in one last way and then we'll maybe move yeah, on? Yeah, then, then let, let's definitely move on. Yeah. So one, one way is to kind of differentiate, um, like, like create a case in which the two break apart. So for instance, um, if you, so let's say, you know, in, in both cases, you have the desire to get ice cream, Brian. Um, but in one case, uh, you know, ice cream just doesn't exist. It hasn't been invented yet. And in the other case, it has been, and you're right next to a store that sells it, right? So in neither of those situations, did you have the ability to do otherwise with respect to your desire for ice cream? You wanted it in both cases. But in one sense, you could exercise guidance control over acquiring it. Um, it was sort of, it's like practically possible. Your intentions can be manifested. Okay. Does that, does okay. that make sense? I think that does make sense. I'll ask okay. more questions if they're okay. come up during the paper. Good, good. Adam, that was coherent, right? Yeah, yeah. I think okay. that's just a good, another good way of looking at it too. Because I think there are several different ways of looking at the um, regular control and guidance control. So, yeah. but, but I think that's a good way of looking at it too. And he Beautiful. says, he says that guidance control breaks down into those two parts. That's basically the rest of this paper. Yeah. Um, the yeah. reasons, moderate reasons, responsiveness and mechanism ownership. Okay, um, cool. So, <clears throat> um, I think if we, if we're kind of loosely following the trend of the paper, we're going to end up looking at the moderate reasons responsiveness first, um, which this, so this actually, I'm, I'm actually curious, um, maybe for Adam and Giffen, well, maybe we can just get into it. This actually but, but clarified, actually, oh yeah. Oh, just for Brian's sake, though, he doesn't actually like go back into defining moderate reasons responsiveness in this true, paper. So, true, true. so is it worth just kind of touching on what we had figured out that how we would define moderate reasons responsiveness? It is, for yeah. For sake of discussion here. Do you want, do you want me to explain that real quick to him? Um, yeah, and then I can kind of chime in okay. on, you know, if there's yeah. any. Yeah, this, this is good. Cause I, this was something that I asked, um, uh, John Fisher about when, when we talked to, um, <clears throat> because there's, 
So, so he, he remember, so being reasons responsive in the right manner is a crucial part of having this guidance control and guidance control is what he says matters for moral responsibility. So that's how it kind of fits into the whole schema, right? So if you're now he, he, when I say reasons responsive of the right way, I mean, moderately reasons responsive. So moderately reasons responsive is just the idea that you Maybe I should contrast it to strong and weak first. So if you're so strong reasons responsiveness would be too strict a requirement in Fisher's view. So that's the idea that if there exists a reason to do something and that reason is rational, it's legitimate, right? Uh, it's sufficient. All, yeah. It's, it's, it's a sufficient, yeah. Yeah, it's a sufficient reason to do X. Um, then if you're a strongly reasons responsive agent, you always do X. So it's sort of a one-to-one match between sufficient reason and action, right? Okay. And that's- And, and also it's, it's, it's a reason you better recognize. So if you recognize mm-hmm. a sufficient reason to not do X, you won't do X. Mm-hmm. It's, it feels like you can just call it, instead of, you could just say reasonable, right? Like it's more specific, but it sounds like it's the same thing. Well, well no. But- like, okay. like, say, I mean, just, just for the sake of like the strong, you know, case here, um, say, you know, I, I don't know if you want to go to a football game this year, but we were kind of using this example, you know, if, if you went out and like, say the tickets, like $150 and we gave, we gave you a sufficient reason not to buy that ticket, which is that it's kind of pricey, right? That, that doesn't have to be, you could, you could acknowledge that as a sufficient reason, Mm-hmm. But you might have other reasons, right? That okay. would override that reason. So it's not like you're yeah. going to act upon that single reason and then just be like, oh, that, that is, I recognize that as a sufficient okay. reason and then act upon it. Okay, so, so it's not enough to say you're reasonable. It's saying more than that. It's saying that yeah. there are multiple. Okay, I, th- I get it. I get it. If, yeah, it's, exactly. if there's any sufficient reason, <laughs> like, you know, you're, you'll are you act um, yeah. with or, regard to that reason. Or maybe even it's sort of like you you always act with respect to like the, the totality of the reasons, right? So like all like the sufficiency of all the reasons points to X or not doing X, and then you always do X or not doing X. Um, yeah. yeah, that's how I it's, imagined it. Cool. It's like, yeah, I got gotcha. you. It's kind of viewing you as this function with these all these different variables, which each variable is a, fu- is a reason and then input it together. That, what is that? Yeah. yeah, I think I got it. You basically, uh, you know, on Fisher's account, you basically get reduced to kind of like an algorithm under that view. It's it's just too strong a connection between sufficient reasons and what you do. You have no freedom in that sense. Gotcha. But the other side of the coin is weak reasons responsive. And this is the like the opposite. It has the opposite peril where all that matters is that you recognize some reason, like in any possible um, like situation any possible circumstance you just recognize some reason and you don't have to act on it ever right so it's just like this way too loose connection between reasons and action what if you what if you cite a reason that doesn't make any sense oh i didn't want to go to the football game because it's tuesday it's like <laughs> yeah you know what i mean it's just like that's not like i guess it's a reason but it doesn't really it's not logically sound or it, it doesn't really explain why i don't know maybe that's in the weeds too much no, no, it's not. So, so that's okay. actually part of his uh, moderate reasons responsiveness is that you, so if you're, so moderate reasons responsiveness holds that uh, you will recognize as a legitimate reason, mm-hmm. all of those reasons, which sort of a rational third party would recognize as reasons and included okay. in that bundle is sort of logical coherence. So your, your point about, so you, you want to go to a football game but you say that a reason not to go is because it's on a Tuesday and it's not because, Oh, you have work on Wednesday. It's not because of like any rational reasons. It's just because for some reason intrinsic to Tuesdays for you is like a non football day. Like that doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense. And it wouldn't. And if you thought that Wednesdays were intrinsically a pro football day, like that, that pattern doesn't really follow. Um, um, yeah, his his example of this was like, um, his example of this was if you if you're thinking of going to a sporting event and you recognize that fifty dollars is an acceptable price because it's not that much money, 
but a thousand dollars is not an acceptable price because it's way too much money. It would be extremely strange if you then thought one thousand and fifty dollars was okay because it wasn't that much money. Like that okay. pattern makes no like sense. Like you're clearly not coherent to any kind Ex- of yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Or um, yeah. Or maybe, a, or maybe, or maybe your reason is that the ticket price has to include the number fifty, which is yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah. like what? What does that mean? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. I so, think I got it. Yeah. And importantly, one last clarification about okay. that. You you need not act on any particular reason, um, if you're moderately reasons responsive. But you you have to recognize as legitimate this kind of table of possible reasons. Like I said, so it's not that you have okay. to actually act on the fact that you know you don't have to like when you buy the ticket hold in your mind all of the numbers for which you would not buy it and all of the numbers for which you would like you don't have to be mm-hmm. you know what I mean that kind of perfect right. agent in that sense. Um, but you do have to just generally adhere to that pattern. And then something okay. that we were talking about that actually, I, it played a big role in my thinking about this paper was, and this isn't as formally worked out because we were just, we were just talking about it in the episode, but it seems like there's also this kind of loosely based character component to the reasons responsiveness as well, which is that. Uh, uh, Fisher was saying, you know, if um, if you had always been sort of a very frugal person, and a thousand dollars on a sporting event was you know way too much for you, and nothing in your material circumstances had changed, but yes, suddenly a thousand dollars was no problem to go to a football game, that mm-hmm. also would be extremely strange and might kind of beg the question of whether you were being reasons responsive in the right way, also. Okay. So there's okay. So there's definitely been definitely been times where I haven't been reasons responsive. <laughs> That's what I'm learning. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Cool. I got it. I think we can move on. It's a <laughs> it's it's a good, uh, very sort of esoteric insult to throw at someone that they're not reasons <laughs> responsive. Yeah. But but also I, I we can just kind of table this for now. Yeah. I also want to discuss at some point, mm. um, just like another area of critique of like this, this framework, which is, um, a kind of like a, I I don't know if it's like a time sensitive critique, but there, I, I, it's kind of what Brian just mentioned there, where it seems like, and we, we obviously can table this, but that someone can be classified as reasons responsive at one point, but then possibly at another point, we could maybe describe them as not being reasons responsive. So what are they in that moment? Are they a reasons responsive agent or are they not? So, yeah. And the part two to that question is, is that change always due to some intrusion of determinism that then begins to make guidance control looks like it collapses into regulative control? which is something we were talking about before. Actually, I meant to say this at the top, but I had, I wrote down on like the cover page of this paper, a bunch of, um, I, I just jotted down like a few questions that we had from last time, because if, if you guys remember, we had like, you know, we kind of ended in a bit of aporia with respect to a lot of questions. Um, so I, I don't think we'll get through all of these, but just kind of, just to keep them in mind. Um, so I'll just run through the questions. How one? How does character tracking fit into reasons responsiveness as the requirement? Um, then we were also thinking about: Are there soft and hard reasons which someone could recognize? So soft, uh, they they're like they have the ability not to recognize and still be reasons responsive, and these may be character based. But the hard reasons are ones that they must recognize in order to be character based, and these ones might be the more purely rational sort of. Uh, like uh, coherent pattern tracking that Brian with, we were talking about the ticket prices, like something like that. Then there was also a question. I think Adam might have brought it up. Does guidance control collapse into regulative control? And then also is mechanism ownership to is mechanism ownership uh, susceptible to intrusions of determinism, which that is more answered in this question. Then, then this, this one, I know we're going to have fun talking about this, the subjective acceptance of mechanism ownership. It just seems like an improper standard. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. All things to build up to. Yeah. And okay. The other two aren't exactly germane to this yeah. paper. Um, yeah. You should probably just continue and flesh out this paper a little bit more. So, 
Um, I was thinking about the idea. What <clears throat> I was thinking about in on one forty six, he gets into the critiques that have been raised against him about how parasitic his thesis is on the kind of notion of of being able to do otherwise. Um, Adam, did you find? Did, I, I thought that that was interesting. Did you? I actually didn't find these critiques interesting. Okay, I, we can skip I, I mean, past I, it I, then. Yeah, I could have missed something here, but I, I didn't, I never in, I interpreted his argument this way. And I saw so it wasn't exactly, was, yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I don't, I, I, can't, I he never seemed to tip his hat at <laughs> actual alternate possibilities. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's like, yeah. you know, it kind of goes back to the idea of like, okay, for the sake of a hypothetical, you know, um, mm. we can look at the, you know, how the actual sequence manifested here as opposed to in the actual sequence in a different world, had this variable been removed or um, had another reason been given or a reason recognized, you know, but otherwise it, it's, it's, I don't think it's that parasitic on that idea. I don't, I mean, no. Did I miss something here, or do you do you think there is anything to these critiques? No, you didn't. Honestly, the level of interest that I had in it depended on if you had some sort of a strong reaction to it. In, in my view, I'm honestly wondering if the way he talks about it is just a little bit of a semantic mistake, as opposed to like a more theory based mistake. Because basically, all of page 146 and 147. I take him to be saying the following. He's basically, if I'm understanding him correctly, laying out this idea that being moderately reasons responsive and, and that applying to the mechanism that actually results, excuse me, in the action, um, it doesn't hinge on you acting differently in like actual possible worlds. It seems to, he, he seems to always bring it back to it's about non-actual hypotheticals in this world. Um, so for instance, if there's things about a situation, situation X, if things about that were to change, then I should recognize those changes in reasons as legitimate if in fact they are, if I'm reasons responsive in the right way and of the right mechanism. But I, I didn't understand. It doesn't seem to me like this has anything to do with with the stronger kind of Frankfurt PAP sense of alternate possible worlds like that. I honestly wonder if that's just like a semantic mistake to even kind of juxtapose it to that because, because I took a lot of the criticism. Who, who did he say? He cited um, uh, both McKenna and Dan speak um, speak about those. Yeah. Criticisms. And, it, and I honestly wonder if it could have been avoided if he merely talked about the, the idea that like if things were to change and then your opinion of the situation changes, that's a, supposed to highlight the fact that you're being reasons responsive. Like you're actually responding to the, the to legitimate changing. changes. Yeah, that, that's, how I, mm -hmm. that is, that's how I read it. Did anyone read it differently than that? No, I mean, that, okay. that's how I read it. No, I think yeah. that's it. Okay, okay, good. I, I was like, it was one of those experiences of reading this where I was like, okay, if he means what I think he means, I'm totally on board. If he doesn't, I have no idea what he's talking about. What he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was one, like you I, are like at the knife's edge point. <laughs> <laughs> I have another definition question. Uh, mm -hmm. Incompatibilist. To me, that's just anyone who's not a compatibilist, which includes both a libertarian and a determinist. Is that correct? It is spot on. Okay, cool. Yes. Um, that is spot on. Yeah. So you could be in incompatibilist in two radically different ways like that. Um, there's like the Robert Kane incompatibilism okay. and then there's the Galen Strassen incompatibilism. Okay. So Dan Speak had an interesting sentence. He said, who cares the, uh, who cares the incompatibilist will ask what the agent would have done under different conditions. And that's in reference to what we've been talking about, the two different worlds. Mm. Um, I kind of thought that that sentence was, I it, it feels weird to me that you wouldn't care, I guess. Like, why yeah. wouldn't you care? 
Where is this? I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, so it's 146 um, in the similarly damned speaks about like five lines down. From that. <laughs> I, I had that very sentence highlighted, Brian. Oh, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's it is actually a really good question because that that's why I think that this is a semantic mistake on Fish's part. Maybe, maybe I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, because I think I think so. So speaks question is you know th so the incompatibilist is going to say yeah right exactly like you said who cares if you could have done differently under different conditions those conditions never arose so like i care what you did under these conditions right mm -hmm. and that is talking about the robust that's talking about regulative control right okay. um which i think is why maybe a fisher used different languages not not about like the ability to do otherwise or or other possible worlds that retort wouldn't come up because i think that he he's not saying like so fisher's not saying under different conditions you would have acted differently and therefore you're either not responsible or responsible R real quick this is this is a quote of what dan speak is saying so yes. i guess i'm a little confused okay why are you saying fisher saying it or hmm. are you kind of going down a bit little to, to the reply I, I was i was giving kind of the reply i think fisher okay, would make gotcha yeah, yeah. yeah you can continue i'm, I'm a, yeah. yeah um yeah because speak says the sentence after the one you read is you know to carry moral weight reactivity needs to have more than just this merely counterfactual basis i think speak there is attacking weak reasons responsiveness okay but um you know, where it's like, okay, <clears throat> you know, in some possible worlds you did differently, right? Because you responded to different reasons because there were different reasons because the world was different. And that's obviously like, yeah, that doesn't, who cares about that? Speaks right. But I don't think that that's what Fisher's talking about when he says that, you know, like, let, let's just, let's just formalize it in an example. So, um, <sighs> It's like a good, I don't know. So you're faced with like an ethical dilemma or something, right, Brian? Mm -hmm. You're faced with, you know, whether to, you're faced with the decision whether to kind of stretch the truth about something on your resume, right? And a reason to do it is that, well, everyone else in the field is puffing their resume. Right. So I've got to puff everyone mine else to keep can up. speak seven languages. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you know, I'll put Hindi on mine as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then, but then a reason not to do it is that you might get caught. Right, right. That's just you know. <laughs> speak Hindi right now. No, <laughs> yeah. Anyway. <laughs> um, um, well, you know, uh, in like in some like you know, you might say like, okay, in a world in which there's no possibility you get caught, you might act differently. And, and like the incompatibles can say like, okay, who cares? Like, okay, that's not the world we live in, right? And Fisher's going to say exactly that's not the world we live in. But the point is that if you were to react differently given different circumstances that's highlighting that you're actually importing and adjusting how you view the situation it in conjunction with the reasons that are actually there and i just think that the way he goes about it maybe is some i don't know it might be just just a semantic mm -hmm. mistake in that okay. way and um, it's also like um he's differentiating different mechanisms to the people operate from in the yeah. sense that like on like page 149 mm. he says similarly it may be well true that the only way a given agent could have reacted differently to an actually existent reason to do x would have been for the past or the laws to have been different mm. it follows in my view that the agent does not have access to non-actual possible to a non-actual possible world in which he reacts differently to the actually existing reason to do X. But given that there are certain worlds in which the past and or laws of nature are different in certain respects, and the agent reacts differently to the actually ex uh, existing reason, he may, be well from, he may well be acting from a general capacity that has the property of reasons responsiveness. So I, I get the idea from that section right there. Mm -hmm. Um, half of what Jordan just said, where it's like, okay, you know, um, if you were to add or subtract a reason or change the history of events, then the mechanism that you're operating from might in just interpret reasons and weigh different reasons differently, but the mechanism would stay constant. But if the laws of nature itself changed, 
well, then the mechanism would change and might therefore behavior would manifest differently. Mm. So, so under this, it's kind of like, okay, there are distinct mechanisms that won't weigh reasons the same. And these mechanisms, um, given different reasons would react differently. So that that's how I'm interpreting those. I had that exact section highlighted too. Yeah. It, yeah. I, I, yeah. I think that fit just adding yeah. that in there, but yes. that, that's kind of what I'm getting from this, you know, non-actual world. Yeah. Um, kind of, it, it's just a hypothetical. He's really, I think he's really using this to highlight the difference between two worlds, not any details about either world. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the thing is like, like, you know, like imagine like in like an alternate world here that, you know, Jordan and I had switched places and, you know, um, were to react and be, you know, to an event and then some behavior would manifest. Well, likely he and I would react differently because in, in this case, we have different mechanisms that we're operating from, or if Jordan had been faced with some ethical dilemma, you know, would have done the heinous thing. Where, where's Adam would have done it's just the upper thing. <laughs> no, no. But if you were, but in the other circumstance, like if you were given a different reason, perhaps you would have, you know, reacted or behaved differently. So I think okay. there are even, kind of even two though things at this, play. Even though you have this. Okay. We had different mechanisms, and if the laws of nature would have been different, Jordan's mechanism might have been different, and therefore would have reacted differently. Okay. Yeah. So, gotcha. um, but the fact remains that he does have a mechanism that will react differently given different reasons, and also mm-hmm. given a change in the laws or in the history of events. Okay. So it, it might be a little, you know, it gets a little shaky about describing it as his mechanism if the laws themselves change. So, <laughs> but but I, I think I get his point overall. Okay. Correct um, me if I'm wrong. The mechanism that we're referring to can be kind of equated to like the person's hardware. It's yes. Like the, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yes. essentially. Um, like yeah. like when Adam says our mechanisms would be different, he's just referring to what makes me like, me and him him, like our brains yeah. essentially. I yeah. Said, yeah. Um, a, set, a, set, a set of physically observable things. Or, or, or I mean, it, it depending uh, on yeah, your theory, of, it could be anything, right? Like yeah, if you, if you right. believe in a soul, it could just be different souls. Like that's just the mechanism, you know? Okay. Whatever, whatever makes... Jordan Jordan is the mechanism. Wherever the locus of my essence is, <laughs> that's <laughs> that's what he means. And right, I and I there. and I I take it that the previous example or the previous paragraph about the piano is is um, trying to highlight that he's focused on this general ability because um, his example is you know even when you're in a situation in which you know how to play the piano but you're kind of, you know, chained to a desk and the piano's across the room. Mm-hmm. You still have the ability to play the piano, but you don't have the ability to, wa- you know, go play the piano for real, right? right? Yeah. So he's almost like, I almost thought he might put it as like ability versus opportunity to play the piano or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so what really, really matters for him is that this you have this general ability of reasons responsiveness issuing from the right mechanism. I, I like I liked his uh, his his verbiage there though because it was like capacity versus exercising that capacity. Mm, yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I, I I think I think that um just I you put it well, but I just wanted to use his. No, his is better. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I skimmed over that. Um, yeah, you're right. Of uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a, that's a better way to put it. I like that. Um, okay, so. I basically agree with everything he says there. We might have different ways of expressing it, but I don't find anything distinctively wrong there. I don't know that that's going to be the following or, or the case for the following section about mechanism individuation. No, this, this is so Brian, just, just to, just to get the sense of why Adam and I are so interested in this. This was our biggest question mark or point of concern with the previous paper. Um, 
And honestly, it all sprung from just one kind of small paragraph in, in the previous paper. Um, but, but okay, m- maybe, so here's what I'd like to do. Let me, I want to read. Uh, well, yeah. well, let me tie it in for Brian real fast mm. here. Um, Cause like you, you might be listening to all this, Brian, and you're like, okay, but I've read Galen and you know, how, how do I, okay. So people can be reasons respond or moderately reasons responsive. Their mechanism can, you know, recognize, you know, a pattern of reasons doesn't necessarily have to act upon those reasons, but can recognize them and then, you know, manifest behavior on the basis of desires. But you might ask, to what degree are people actually responsible for their mechanism? So that's where I feel like um, Fisher kind of ties in mechanism ownership. So which we're going to get into here. And he's got a way of kind of viewing that. So yeah okay i think i'm gonna read the majority of the first three paragraphs in this section because i think that there's that's required so he says semi-compatibilism has it that the freedom relevant condition necessary and sufficient for moral responsibility is guidance control on my view guidance control has two distinguishable elements, mechanism ownership and reasons responsiveness. One exhibits guidance control insofar as one's behavior results from one's own moderately responsive mechanism. So he has given accounts of uh, each of these components. So my approach to mechanism ownership is subjective. One makes a kind of mechanism one's own by taking responsibility for acting from that kind of mechanism. On this sort of view, one acquires control at least in part by taking control. I and my co-author offered the following three conditions for taking responsibility. So the first one is that the individual must see himself as an agent. He must see that his choices and actions are efficacious in the world. Two is that the individual must accept that he has a f- he he is a fair target of the reactive attitudes as a result of how he exercises this agency in certain contexts. And three, the individual's view of himself, as specified in the first two conditions, must be based in an appropriate way on the evidence. Now, now yeah, let me stop there because there's okay. I have a bunch of questions about this. Um, first of all let me table the reason why we're so interested in it, which is Adam's objection to this in the previous episode. Adam basically brought up the point that, well, look, you know, you could, so, well, let me explain real quickly, Brian, there's this whole uh, sub literature on what are called Frankfurt cases, but the basic idea of all of them is that you could, so let's imagine uh, a device that's implanted in your brain And this device controls all of your thoughts and desires and intentions. uh, And it just takes control of you essentially, but in a way that you don't, it doesn't feel like you're being controlled. It's not like, Oh, you know, my hand is raising up and I can't get it to go down. It's not like that. It would feel exactly like I'm doing, you know, feeling now, except basically instead of me saying these words, it's, you know, someone essentially typing in. You're being controlled. Yeah, exactly. So, Adam brought up the objection that, wow, okay, if you're going to say that mechanism ownership is subjective and that it requires that someone just take responsibility from acting from a mechanism for that mechanism to be your own, well, then why couldn't, if you were being controlled by this external device, if that device made you take responsibility for acting from that device, that seems to fit with Fish's account. However, intuitively, that's an extremely odd case of you owning the mechanism because it's, it's hard to find any way in which you do own it. Does that objection make any sense to you? That, that sounds, I guess it all just sounds a little bit weird to me because to, to me, I've kind of viewed the mechanism as the person. So it's hard for me to say like you own your, yourself. That sounds weird to say. So it sounds like my understanding of mechanism is a little off maybe. Well, I, I could say by owning the mechanism in this case, I could say, okay, um, this mechanism acts without manipulation. Okay. Like this is, this is, I, I own this. This is um, insofar as it is mine, it isn't influenced by any other agent. 
no other agent is acting through me. Okay. Maybe, maybe a way to also bring it out, Brian, is saying like, okay, you do a certain action, right? And I mm-hmm. say, well, Brian, don't you understand? Like that, that action resulted from your brain. You'd be like, okay, yeah, yeah, I figured that it did, right? Mm-hmm. Like you would, you would take ownership of that mechanism. But if I said, you know, Brian, you did this action. I said, Brian, don't you understand? Uh, I actually inserted a device into your brain while you were asleep and it didn't control anything else, but it did actually force you to do that one action. So you had no control over it. Does, would you feel, oh, is there some sense in which you feel like, oh, that's not me anymore. That's not really yes. my action. Okay. I do feel that. Okay. So that's all I think. So Adam's like objection in the previous one was highlighting oh, that. Okay. Wow. Yeah. But what about if that mechanism had a second action that just made you radically, you know, it, it, it made you accept that, oh, sure, sure. It was the device in my brain. Okay. I'm okay with that. Even though you wouldn't have felt that otherwise. Right. And okay. Ad, yeah. And Adam's point was, wow, that example fits uh, with this subjective accepting of the mechanism. Yet it seems like a situation or a case in which that's obviously not a, a situation that we want to hold you morally responsible precisely because you don't, in some sense, own the mechanism. Does, yeah. does that, does you, that you, make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that does make sense. Okay. Adam, I was characterizing that correctly, right? Yeah, I think so. I, I think the only... The only slight thing I would change there is that in the case that I brought up, um, it's it's one in which you wouldn't recognize mm-hmm. that there was some sort of device that had made you uh, behave in that way. You would still like there would be like this continuity where, you know, uh, <laughs> 10 days ago I had mechanism ownership, but then suddenly this device was implanted and I didn't know it. And but the device itself still continued that continuity of mechanism ownership. <laughs> that, that, that sense where I'm like, yeah, I, yeah, I'm exactly. still acting. You know, I still have um, this mechanism is mine. It's not. It is not under the influence of any other. You know, uh, you know malevolent actor mm. in any sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but I, I think this next little sentence here, right after the ones you read, is yeah. actually like it's. I think it's the biggest trip in the paper. In yeah, terms of like just uh, well, I I I, oh. I like I liked this one like 50 50. I right, know, so, I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got such mixed right. feelings about this. I want to dive in. All right. So he says, further on our view, one takes one takes responsibility for acting from certain general kinds of mechanisms. An individual is morally responsible for acting from a particular mechanism. Only if he has taken responsibility for acting from mechanisms of that kind. So what I interpreted from that, which was, <laughs> which is pretty crazy, is like, um, I think you know, Brian, you had just said that, like in the the scenario Jordan had given, you're like, okay, I I wouldn't take responsibility for that behavior, right? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, of of something implanted in my brain that had made me do that action, right? right. Like I don't take responsibility for that. Mm-hmm. that's not part of my mechanism exactly mm-hmm. so you're not taking responsibility for acting from mechanisms of that kind so mm-hmm. you're you're only held responsible or responsible for acting um from a particular okay. mechanism that you recognize uh and take ownership for yeah okay so you could accept that that chip is part of your mechanism, and in that scenario, you could, and, that, yeah. and that, that's the problem actually with this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I see. Is that because you, you can, know, yeah? It, but I, I think what I like about this is that in how it actualizes, I think is pretty good in the sense that most people you talk to and everybody on this podcast would agree that they wouldn't take responsibility for acting from a mechanism like that. So in this case, we wouldn't be morally responsible. We would be kind of shunning or, you know, um, you know, eschewing responsibility from acting from that mechanism. But you could hypothetically imagine a person 
you know, unless you know, someone wants to take this perspective on the podcast, but you can imagine, <laughs> you can imagine, imagine <laughs> yeah, but you could imagine someone who's just genuinely, they, they're not just saying it, but they're willing to take responsibility for that mechanism acting through them. Mm-hmm. Whether that could just be like the device itself that, mm-hmm. you know, right. There, um, so, so there could be, <laughs> I mean, I, I said it would be madness if you did accept that, but but just to be chari- <laughs> just, just to be charitable to that position, if like someone listening happens to hold it, I mean, there is there is kind of a more reasonable style of that where where it's like, okay, let's say that there is a device that just amplifies your kind of brain power, for lack of a better technical term, right? So basically, just it just allows you to do everything quicker. It doesn't change the outcome of any of your reasoning. It just everything happens quicker. It seems to me that that, so that's like a very soft case of kind of like edging into accepting a different mechanism, right? Where I could say, I'm okay and will take responsibility for anything, you know, for, for me after time T, T being like where I get the device implanted. Um, but this is where, this is where I was really wondering if the crucial part of, of what he and I discussed is, is kind of um, implicitly at play in a way that would be really nice if it were explicitly brought out, which is that character coherence across time. So basically I was thinking, I was thinking about this while I was reading the paper. Um, So I guess my suggestion is, is kind of hearkening on part C of his argument because, so it seems like section. So, so premises a and B that the individual sees himself as an agent and that he accepts that he's a fair target of the reactive attitudes, those two seem like they're very susceptible to manipulation, right? By these thought experiments, the the device is planted in your brain, right? So I'm wondering if sort of strengthening premise C is what would um, help buttress his, his, or kind of just, just shore up the notion here. So the individual's view of himself, um, you know, as specified in the first two conditions must be based in an appropriate way on the evidence. Now he, he we'll talk about like what he means by the evidence, cause that's tough to nail down on, but what about, <clears throat> so what about this? Um, what about the, we were talking about this before that the, the temporal character based account. So maybe I'm wondering if the standard uh, has to do with what the person's previous self would endorse as a mechanism. And this is exactly what Adam, you were kind of beginning to bring up. So like me now, let's assume <clears throat> that I am not under the influence of any mechanisms for which I would not uh, accept as my own. Right. So let's make it an easy kind of starting point. If I, so right now I would say I eschew anything that I do that results from, for instance, a brain tumor. And we understand that that brain tumor would be, it has to actually be causally linked, right? Like I I can't just have a brain tumor and then just like kill Giffen and it's not related at all to the brain tumor. I appreciate the example. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And and like, and I'm like, but, but I had a brain tumor. The doctor's like, it had no causal connection. What about this notebook uh, from before you got the tumor that says you wanted to kill Giffen? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Oh, yeah, exactly exactly <laughs> it's just like, i intend to kill you <laughs> yeah so mm-hmm. exactly so if it's causally connected i would not take i would not accept ownership of any actions that resulted from that right mm-hmm. i also wouldn't do that for a device implanted in my brain um maybe given the details like i might accept the one that just improves my processing power by 20 percent or whatever And let's say that, let's say that under that example, the increased processing allows me to arrive at a conclusion that I would have arrived at anyway, but quicker, um, obviously because of the increased processing power, but in the situ in the scenario in which I didn't have that device, I actually never would have reached that conclusion, not because I wouldn't have reached it, but because I would have run out of time due to just some pragmatic reason. Right. I am. I am currently okay accepting the ownership of the results of that mechanism, um, even though I also accept that it might be different from who I am now. So I'm wondering if 
if injecting this sort of kind of temporally coherent character based account is what might now i don't know if it seals up all the gaps but i don't know what maybe adam specifically since this was like your biggest thing too what do you think about that idea for shoring up a little bit of the slipperiness of the mechanism ownership i i definitely get your point but i still have some major issues with it yeah because it, ju- it just seems like you're not owning the mechanism you know of, a, of your future self that does this given the change in the mechanism. So, but I, I just, um, you, you could say that about, you know, what about you at the age of 70? You know what I mean? Like, what if you grow up to be some twisted old man? You know what I mean? Just like, yeah. I mean, right now you could disavow a mechanism that would be capable of something that you're, you, that you would do at 70. And that's all in good. You can disavow that mechanism, not take ownership for future behavior, you know, hypothetical mm-hmm. behavior. But I still feel like we have to judge the present you, you know, and I mean, where it's like um, there is a mechanism in play, even though you've got the tumor Yeah. where it, that mechanism is different than the mechanism you have now. But mm-hmm. to what extent is the future you with the tumor morally responsible? Is it still reasons responsive? Like, like I, I mean, yeah. So I don't, I don't think that the character coherence can replace like another standard. You know what I mean? Like it's like, it's clearly you're you're pointing out. It's clearly a weaker, it's weaker than either Frankfurt's second order desire or a reasons responsive account like you can't just say like okay well it coheres with your character therefore you're morally responsible right because i mean there's obvious counter examples to that um <clears throat> but i wonder i'm wondering if not i there's like a really slippery kind of notion here where it's like because clearly your character changes over time that's obvious but there's also, but there, I also have the obvious intuition, and Fisher and I talked about this, where too radical a change or too quick a change um, does look like it, it does kind of beg the question, like what went wrong? You know what I mean? So, like Adam, if you wake up tomorrow and you've got a Trump 2024 sign on your car, I'm going to be like, okay, what went wrong? <laughs> you know, like no, not like you're responsible for that. It would um, seem like a discontinuity. Sure. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. It's just like, um, so wait. I, I guess they could fall into like the pattern where it's like, yeah. you know, there seems to be a discontinuity <laughs> almost in the pattern where you yeah. could imagine like a pattern can subtly change in how you recognize sufficient reasons over time. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But there would be a disrupt, you know, an, an abrupt discontinuity in your pattern of recognizing sufficient reasons if yes. this happened within a day, you know. Yeah. So I'm, so I'm, I'm happy to like, you know, uh, kind of sign off on that. So, I, because I, I, I don't like this. These are just like extremely loose thoughts, um, which is why I don't know. I'm struggling because there's obviously, it seems clear that this fits into the theory somehow, but what does it supersede and what is it subservient to? I don't know. And sort of how does it fit in with, with the, the mechanism ownership? I don't know. Um, Actually, can I, yeah. Like what about like a scenario in which like some sort of crime of passion, Mm. You know, like, like in the moment, you know, you, you might not be moderately reasons responsive. (laughs) Like, like, honestly, you might actually be incapable of recognizing sufficient reasons that you otherwise would have three hours ago. So, so, so like, to what extent do you own the mechanism at that time? Yeah. To what extent are you reasons responsible? I mean, reason (laughs) responsive and to what extent are you actually responsible in this framework for that behavior. I got, I, I think there are, there are a lot of issues. It's so good. You know? The question you asked is so good because you could almost ask it another way, which is like a challenge to Fisher's challenge of Frankfurt, which is basically, are you just an, un- don't you succumb to the same issues that Frankfurt does with the unwilling addict in that case then? 
Yeah. It, it's just yeah. I, I, yeah. The, the very cases where it seems like we want to hold you re, like re, responsible are the very cases in which like you had no control. <laughs> like, <it's, laughs> you've lost it's, your reason yeah. responsiveness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. And, and like it's, yeah. it's extremely plausible too. like that. Oh, and by the way, I need I need to throw this out there. I'm mm. actually plagiarizing that. That was from a conversation I had with a friend last night. Oh, about okay. about this yeah yeah she's okay. very insightful about these things and she, okay. she came up with that one on the fly she's like i have an issue with this and she gave that example and i'm like okay okay i'm gonna nice. <laughs> i'm bringing up that example because <laughs> that's I, a cause great I'm example because like, that yeah. seemed like a, i'm like yeah we wouldn't hold you responsible because you're not re- I was, responsive in yes. that moment so. yeah and, and, and then it's like and then i mean you really can raise the exact same style of critique against Fisher that he raises against Frankfurt, which is like, okay, look at the scenario in which I I'm just, you know, I eat the donut. Like I'm, I'm not actually reasons responsive in some of those situations. Some I probably am, but some I'm just like, you just get overpowered by like the fuck it essentially. Do you know what I mean? It is like pure chemical impulse. And there's like yeah. you know, nothing's gonna yeah. overpower your desire for you, sugar. You could imagine like you could imagine like snarling like no, I don't recognize it as a reason. It's just going, going yeah, a deep with argument it. with your yeah. like own past self of like four minutes ago, just like mm-hmm. incoherent. Yeah, exactly. And, and, but the problem is, is like I'm realizing that's not even that's not even like ugh, my character based account. I don't even know if that helps because the problem is, is that is a blip in character, right? Like. In a way, it's like, does that not reflect on you in some like meta way? Like, yeah, the, your action kind yeah. of reflect the fact that you know, in a certain set of circumstances, mm-hmm. you, you did you that. Do have so weakness. that that does kind yeah, exactly of reflect on your character. It's just we didn't previously know that. Mm-hmm. It, it gets very difficult to even just like get a you know tangible grasp on what it, even like one's character could be. But it's like I a gif, and I totally agree with you. But at the same time, it's like under Fisher's approach here, it's like, you've got to own the mechanism. To what extent do you own the mechanism of that blip? You know what I mean? Like it's, because it's like crimes of passion do happen where Mm -hmm. people like, I mean, if I doubt Fisher would like just give that kind of exception to every crime of passion, you know? No, no, he he definitely doesn't want to. Yeah, but he's committed to that based on just like what we're reading here. Cause I, cause I was like, yeah, I mean like, um, like when I was talking with this friend, I'm like, you know, I mean, maybe if you were to pull this person off to the side, you know, would they still recognize? But then all you've done reasons? is just introduced an alternate world. It's just the world in which you pulled them aside and the one in which you didn't. No, right? I know. I mean, like, again, yeah. a potential world, you know what I mean? Like, which yeah, you yeah, like yeah. In, in which like, so um, if, if you were to pull them aside in that moment, mm-hmm. would they recognize sufficient reasons? Mm-hmm. And, and the thing is, <laughs> what possibly, <if> they not. <laughs> yes, yeah, possibly, possibly not. Possibly <laughs> not. Possibly not. What if they don't? Then what? Yeah. Yes, I mean, like, yes. cause I, you can, I can definitely buy into that, that people might not be able to recognize sufficient reasons. Oh, 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 yeah. people for oh, sure. Don't. All the time. Yeah. Oh, say, for sure. It's like, very common. Yeah. Oh, it's like yeah. The, we have all of us but, in our worst moments. But yeah. 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 Just because yeah. you can't recognize a reason doesn't mean you don't have reasons, though. Well, sure. Well, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, the, but the very fact that you wouldn't recognize them is what he was hinging, you know, part of his guidance control on. Yeah. Not, I, yeah. I'm imagining a scenario <laughs> where, like, just like one of those like impulse kind of um, passion crimes or whatever. Just like the five minute ago, you just like sees the actions of like the five minutes in the future. You'd be and, a whore. A whore. Like, yeah. this, this man is not, I recognize no mechanism here. Dude, you don't have to imagine that. that that's just me every time I have something with like added sugar. I'm just like, what you ate? Like, what have you done? Like, you just re-embody your past self and just, just disavow no, no, the, the lit- moment. <laughs> Dude, phenomenologically, it literally is a blip in character. Like most of the time, I don't succumb to the sweet. But then when I do, it's like, what the hell happened? It's like, like, what? Like, it's just like, like, what? Like, what did, what did you do? And, and, and like, I feel like I so thought we much settled of this problem like, yes. myself. <laughs> it's like, it's like so much of this falls apart with that example, because it's like the individual must see himself as a genetic. Or as an agent. And like, you know, Fisher goes on to say, you know, oh, actually, and this must be based upon the evidence where it's not that 
you must actually be an agent that that's based on the evidence, but you mm. must see yourself. Yeah. And that, and the seeing yourself as an agent needs to be based on the evidence. So it's more of just like an epistemic claim as he, yeah. as he says. So, but even that it's like in that moment, do you see yourself as an agent where you're just <laughs> acting out blind rage? You know and what I mean? And like, especially, like, and especially in reflection, I don't think you would. Yeah. 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 So I, I feel this like a is, lot of this is it has has a, has a major issues with examples like that. Here's what we're def, we're definitely reading a paper next by Susan Wolf about defending an asymmetry between positive and negative actions in this sense because I I don't know exactly what her paper says but here's my intuition before reading it. We'll do an intuition check for me before and after the paper. God. I feel like I feel like if I reflect on so, like you know I applied to UCR today was I responsible for what I did? Yes. Did I act in character? Yes. You know, am I going to, I'll own the mechanism for all of that. Right. Mm -hmm. When, if I happened to, I didn't today, but like, what if I had eaten a donut? No, I'd be like, no, like I, I like, I don't relate to that person. <laughs> <laughs> like, I deny this person. Yeah. It's like, it's like clearly, okay. Like I did it. I'm not saying like I wasn't causally responsible for like the disappearance of the donut or, but, do you, right. but like, so the problem is, is that you can, it's just, I wonder if, like, is Susan's Wolf you, paper you, claiming that there's an asymmetry between the positive and like the negative? I don't aspect? know. A, I've just skimmed it. So I don't want to like say something that misrepresents it, but it seems okay. like she defends an asymmetry between sort of positive and negative um, actions in that sense. That's which, very curious. Yeah. Interesting. It, <laughs> it seems to map on just like based on your like, uh, you know description without having read it it sounds like it maps onto kind of like our behaviors in general it's like <laughs> the urge the impulse to like take responsibility for like the you know positive things align with it and then just whenever you see that negative aspect of yourself come out you're like what what a cretin this is like not me in <laughs> any way which is funny because it also goes back to his his critique of and this isn't a critique that we found particularly uh powerful i don't think um but but it goes back to his critique that you know oh you know frankfurt's account is parasitic on this kind of hierarchy of self and actually i i think i really believe this but i i think adam you did too right where it was like that that's not an issue for us no. um at all but the problem is is that like i i wonder if reason's responsiveness is a little bit parasitic on that too where it's like there does seem to be a hierarchy coming out where in the moments where you are reasons responsive, those are higher in value than the reason or the, the cases where you're not, um, even though it could track character or not over time and be the same mechanism or not over time. Yeah. And, and also just, just kind of going off of your invocation of Frankfurt there, honestly, when you were talking about the donut, I felt myself naturally slipping back. It's like the Frankfurt model there where it was like, honestly, yeah, I actually wouldn't see you as you know, like uh, You're just the unworthy yes. Like for yes. yeah, exactly, it's, it's completely yes. compulsive behavior where it's like, it, I don't think it's a like 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 one of the critiques you were just mentioning was like the fact that okay, like this hierarchy has been imposed, but you know, it's not self evident that there should be a hierarchy. I completely disagree with that. There's definitely like <laughs> second order desires, especially in this case where it's like. At that moment where you ate the donut, I wanted it. Like wh I didn't whether want to. <laughs> exactly, what, like whether like those thoughts, like whether you were cognizant of the second order desires at that point, it doesn't make a difference to me. Where it's like after eating that donut, like you didn't want to want to eat that donut, but you did anyway, yeah. and now you see yourself as just like you said, the unwilling addict, and it's like, mm. yeah, I do too. You know what I mean? Like yep, I, I would yep. see you that way too, where it's like, <laughs> it really, that's not behavior that yes. or this, it's not a desire you wanted to become actionable. Well, because like it's, it's compulsive and, and you're not responsible for it. That's crazy. Do you, do you so. remember, do you, do you remember <laughs> in the 2012 paper that we previously read Fisher has some remark about this very point where he said, I don't remember the exact language, but he said, you know, let's assume that you have a desire to indulge in some vice. And I don't remember what the vice was, but it was something like this. The donut will work. Vape. And he, <laughs> you want a jewel. Adam's like, not a vice. Doesn't count. <laughs> yeah. Actually, 
it goes all the way up for me in terms of desires. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I want it terminates want to want at, the, at the fourth level. Just yeah. I want to want to want to hit this mm-hmm. face. It's just, it's just, it's just <laughs> water. How bad I want to be? want to want to just like the smoke clouds below. Yeah. <laughs> I'll confuse every order of every desire. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He organizes his life around vapor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why I it, save it, this child or take a hit? It doesn't matter whether I can like whether this is my ideal ego or my <laughs> or, or okay. my true self because either fully endorses this behavior. Exactly. Or so. <laughs> so. exactly. So. Um, but but so the donut will work for for that example and so he says you know let's imagine that this is a resistible desire but he doesn't you know it's not like a heroin addiction which is just you know physiologically addictive like no one Mm -hmm. really besides like you know kind of like crazy republicans blame heroin addicts yeah you have a chip Um, inside your head yeah essentially yeah yeah it's you got a chip in your veins in that example yeah general Um, addiction yeah so so fish is saying, okay, like it's not that. It's just like you just really want to donut, and this is a is this is a desire that you could and should be able to resist. On one sense, we do pragmatically think about it in that way, right? Like, but but in another sense, doesn't it really come down to just if you do resist it or not? If you don't resist it, was it really resistible? Like, it, it, not for you, evidently. Not for you <laughs> in that time. Like under those conditions, it wasn't, and and. This goes back, I guess this goes back to the previous, you know, sen- discussion in which like, okay, in what sense is like alternative possibilities relevant to his example? And yeah, you still have the general abilities that you have, <clears throat> right? Going back to his like piano example. But in that case, I didn't have, and this is where I really wonder if Frankfurt's account is better at conceptualizing cases of weak-willed action specifically than than fish's account where it's like i to adam's point i actually really do naturally think about it in terms of orders of desires i don't think about it as like was i properly reasons responsive in that case it's just did my desires align or did they not yeah i i I honestly in that case i'm totally with like the frankfurt model but then like honestly like going through some reasons responsiveness here like there are I feel the pull of all of that too. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Because it's like, I, I was just trying to like conceptualize like reasons responsiveness to an extent, and I think for me, like the logic went like this, where it was, okay, let's just say for arguments that you are responsible for your mechanism, right? Like you know, <laughs> let's imagine that your cause is suing. Right. So <laughs> it's, 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 it's incoherent. I know. But continue. I know. Yeah. But, you must but, continue. but like in this uh framework of like semi-compatibilism here, you know, say you were presented with all the reasons for and against doing something, and you decide one way, but you couldn't have decided otherwise. I'm I'm perfectly fine for that. Like I'm perfectly fine with that. I mean, like how I I can't imagine any other circumstance where it's like you have a mechanism that is recognizing reasons for and against weighing the strength of those reasons and then acting upon those reasons. Why would you ever act differently? Like, 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 given, given that the reasons were the same, you mean, given that the reasons were the same. Yeah, because like, like in this circumstance, like all the reasons you've been running all possible reasons. All the reasons, yes. All possible <laughs> reasons. Why? Why would your? Why would the outcome be any different? Like, like why another would you view one this. reason is? Why would you view suddenly view one reason is stronger than another? It's like is that is that simply a random? Is that random that you would view one as stronger than the other? RNG is a component to the reasoning. <laughs> An- yeah, another it, yeah like another way of asking this is just why would you even desire libertarian free will right like, <laughs> like what does that even get you yeah I'm, I'm not even sure where it comes in at this point i think i, I think like yeah. that is just like it just completely drops out where it's like okay no matter like whether you view it as like the mind or the soul or just some general mechanism there should even be, get you <laughs> yeah. you, you should arrive at Freedom, a decision brother. yeah like you like you should arrive at a decision that you know, you make actionable that is based on 
how that mechanism views the respective reasons, yeah. weighs them, and then makes a decision. It well, shouldn't be like it, it shouldn't be based on anything else. And this is a point that I've made. I've heard like we've moved away from his because he has like a very, I don't want to say simplistic, but like it's the resolution isn't as as uh, specific as all of these papers. But like Sam Harris has made this point in many talks before. But he's like that's exactly what it means to reason. Like you're driven from behind essentially by these reasons. Like when like it's exactly it's it's exemplified in the case of you, Adam, reading the previous paper. You were a fan of Frankfurt. You thought that his view was the best view. You were out picketing for him. And then you you read the 2012 paper and you're like, okay, these are gut punches to like a, like a, a, sure. a fan of Frankfurt. And that is not due to you being able to weigh the reasons pro and con and then just decide irrespective of the reasons what to vote. It's like that. Why would you even want that? Like. Yeah, it, well, it, what it, would it, you be it, deciding based on that? It would just be, it would just be exactly almost not even exactly. deciding at that point. <laughs> no, exactly it's just doing it, it's like it's like Wolf's point about like being in just neither like the, the the reactive or the objective stance, but just you know with this analogy, it's like you're just neither conforming nor disconforming with reasons. It's just like you just you're like raw chaos at that point. Exactly, like like I've been presented with all the reasons. And I could have chosen one way, but then I also could have chosen the other way. And like, what was like, what, oh, oh, like one reason, you know, was especially strong for me in one case, but then wasn't so much in the other case. Well, why? Why? I mean, (laughs) you know what I mean? And it's like, you can imagine that situation based on just pure randomness. Um, But otherwise it's like, I, I don't know where you get, you know, free will in that case. You know what I mean? Just like, uh, it's, no. <laughs> it's like <laughs> any, any freedom worth having. It's <laughs> like, I think as Fisher says somewhere, um, can, can I, can we return and maybe we'll start to kind of close down the episode a little bit, but I was thinking about, I don't know what this might elucidate. I, I know what I was thinking before this conversation, but maybe just returning a little bit to the character point can i read the case of chum because i was because i was (laughs) please (laughs) because because i was thinking about how the character kind of impulse that we're drawn to fits in with respect to that example so um okay this is fisher quoting judish um who has a response to fisher so uh this is judish um Consider the case of Chum. Aside from the unfortunate name, what were his parents thinking? (laughs) Chum is a perfectly ordinary adult. He was raised in a happy home, received a normal moral education, and took responsibility when a young man for his mechanisms in order of ordinary practical reasoning and the like. Never once was he subjected to the slightest form of manipulation, and his moral and social development has left him a well-adjusted and responsible man. Now suppose that one night, while Chum is soundly asleep, he spontaneously develops a debilitating brain lesion. The lesion is situated in his neural network in such a way that his capacity for practical reasoning is severely impaired. The relevant mechanism no longer even approximates the standard of moderate reason's responsiveness. Imagine now that a benevolent neuroscientist, Dr. White, is somehow made aware of Chum's plight. Without rousing Chum, he springs into action. Unfortunately, there is no way he can remove the lesion without causing irreparable damage to Chum's brain, but but, but what But White has a few handy electronic devices that enable him literally to get around that problem. Here's how the devices work. The first, planted just upstream of the lesion, takes as inputs the messages sent through the neural pathways headed right for the spot where the lesion is located and transmits the incoming data via radio signals to the other device located just downstream of the lesion, which device in turn... Uh, relays the appropriate impulses to the neural pathways just downstream of it. The result is that the lesion is both successfully isolated and bypassed, its potentially deleterious effects completely cut off from the rest of Chum's brain. Indeed, Chum's post-surgery cognitive architecture is functionally equivalent to his pre-surgery brain. When Chum awakens, he is, of course, completely unaware of the evening's events. As far as he is concerned, it is business as usual. That's a very, I, first of all, it's a very cool thought exper- experiment. Um, yeah. very. But secondly, so this is Fisher uh, in response to that. 
Judish's view is that Chum can legitimately be considered morally responsible for his subsequent behavior. He contains he contends, however, that on the Fisher Revisa approach, Chum cannot be deemed morally responsible. After all, we contend that if scientists manipulate your brain in a clandestine fashion, you have not taken responsibility for the mechanism that actually issues in your behavior, the manipulation mechanism. And it seems to Judish that we should say the same thing about the case of Chum. Now, he goes on to talk about why he, excuse me, is not necessarily committed to that conclusion. But I kind of wanted to think about the case of Chum from that character um, account. So it seems like, <clears throat> and Fisher kind of talks about this, there's an important difference here between cases of restoration versus manipulation, right? And and I want to table kind of status quo bias for a second, right? But it's like, so, so it seems clear to me that Chum is obviously exactly as morally responsible post-surgery as he was pr- before. Do you, do you, you guys match that intuition too, I'm assuming, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, if I ask myself why I believe that, it's because... There's no functional difference, right? And it, but, but I was wondering if also it was due to the fact that if Chum were, because here's, here's, so here's, I think there's two implicit things working here, but I want to kind of ask you guys a question about this. The first thing is that it seems implicit that, and almost explicit, that Chum regular and Chum prime with the device would do the exact same things uh, in both alternate worlds, right? That seems implicit, almost nearly explicit. And then secondly, it also seems like if Chum were to be told of that evening's uh, events, that he would accept that mechanism ownership. And I see that Adam agrees with that. I find that to be implicit in the thought example as well. And I think that that is where some of my intuitions were trying to drive that with the the character based account of mechanism ownership, where if you, because, because I would accept that mechanism, right? If it's functionally equivalent, you three would accept that as well. I'm assuming, right? Yeah. So I'm just take it up. Exactly. (laughs) So, because that's, I'm, I'm glad you brought up this one. Yes. This is, yes. I, I was going the same way you okay, were. Great. Where it's like, okay, so, so well, take we, it up we, then, yeah. yeah, we've done this with one part of the brain, but we're going to replace every part of the brain. Yes. Um, with this same technology. And, but we have to mention that it's functionally equivalent. Would you still take mechanism ownership? If it's functionally equivalent, but it's a completely robotic brain. I would. Yeah, Yeah, I would. If it's functionally equivalent, I would. And I think, and I think that the thing that is the thread tying this together is the, is the character coherence over time, because I think that it dis it, because it discup. So if, if my intuitions are being coherent here, what I've just discovered about myself is that I don't care about the specific details of the mechanism. I care that they match and it's about the matching that matters to me. So I would eschew or disavow uh, moral responsibility, even if the change looked more similar, but had a different function expressed in, in my character. So if, you know, one small part of my brain were swapped with a cadaver brain, that were you know it it functioned but it didn't function equivalently i wouldn't own that mechanism because i'd be like that's not me in the same sense that like if i if i came to a different if anything were functionally different because of that surgery that would be less me adam are you agree Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I, I mean, I, I totally agree. But I'm just, I'm just imagining in that scenario that the cadaver brain is you know, the thing. Wake, wake, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you're waking to... up, and then, and then yes. 
you know, taking ownership of that mechanism exactly. that point wait, wait, wait. <laughs> in your body at that point. So it's like, you know, so, so, so we've got to, you're, you're right. I've got to stimulate <laughs> that the part of your brain that was replaced is not the same part that would. So let, let's say that. It, so the part of your brain has mostly to do with, um, I don't remember what part of the brain this actually is, but with coarse motor function, right? So I'm not as good as, you know, me prime, pretty, pretty decent at throwing a football. I get in a car accident, one part of my brain is damaged and it gets replaced with a cadaver brain, or it gets replaced with this, um, you know, neural link, you know, software, whatever, or hardware, whatever it is. Right. But after that, I'm no longer as good at throwing the football. There is a sense in which I take absolutely no responsibility for my degradation there. Um, because I don't own that mech, like I don't accept that mechanism, and it would actually be the same thing on the pl on the plus side too. It's just that I would have a more, I'd be like, well, yeah, I'm not responsible. It's kind of sick that I'm like an NFL quarterback at this point. You know what I mean? But I wouldn't be. I wouldn't. Okay. So, yeah. So, hmm. Okay. So if this happened when you were like five years old for the rest of your life, would you not accept your mechanism? Am I misunderstanding? Well, I wouldn't accept anything that I, well. So, Accept is a weird, I don't know. It depends what you mean by accept. Um, I wouldn't. No, it's, it's subjective. So it's like you kind of define your own mechanism, right? No, I, I meant a different, I, I meant a different like way of accept. So I, I would, I, I wouldn't sort of like, okay. Any positive um, results from that, I'd happily accept. Like I'm not going to not use my newfound abilities. Right. But right. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't uh -huh. see myself as responsible for them in the same way that I am for my non altered. Um, okay. Hmm. Why? I, I actually, Why? I, I actually Which have a different intuition. I, I was going to say, I, I think well. we've got uh, a weird delay. Okay. Okay. But, but yeah, Giffen and I have different delay. intuitions. <laughs> yeah. I, I think we resynced here. Is everyone hearing me at the same time? I think so. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Okay, but I Brian, think Brian's delay. delay. Yeah, I think Brian, you're delayed. <laughs> okay, I think my internet shit. That sounds better now. <laughs> that was pretty quick. That was pretty quick. Okay, wait. Sorry. So, okay. So, Adam and Giffen, I missed what you said because of the the delay. Yeah. So the mech, like, I honestly am imagining myself accepting like ownership over a mechanism in a case s similar to what we're describing. So let me give you an example, maybe. Um, so. A lesion develops in my brain overnight, and then the doctor comes in, and he's able to like get ridiculously close to the previous mechanism, but it's like slightly, slightly different post, right? Maybe like the consequence of this is like I have a sl marginally increased propensity to like consume cheese, like something that's really, really okay. like small, right? I think post even being told that like there was a slight change, I'd probably take ownership. But wait. Is that because you're okay with eating more cheese? Would or is it because you actually are okay with the mechanism? Would you I think also feel I think, that way about if you were slightly more had a slightly higher propensity to commit murder? <laughs> right? I don't think you would. Well, on the, the one thing is if it's so close, like the if the change is very minuscule, I think mm -hmm. like I mean like <laughs> so I, yeah, my answer is actually yes. Now. Yeah. If I am yeah. Wait, so really? marginally more like inclined towards murder, like it probably wouldn't manifest over like just one lifetime unless I was already very close to like committing murder. Well, but the so, problem, yeah, you know, is... I, I, I don't think it's more about like whether you do or don't, yeah. but I, but, but for me, I actually completely align with Giffen. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I'm, yeah, no, because the thing is, I would like, take ownership. Like would I eat a little more cheese or like, you know, in a way that won't more, manifest, but I'm I think that's only because you're time. okay with the outcome. No, I'm talking about the, I'm, I'm talking about like even being a little more murderous. Because yeah, like the I thing agree. is like, <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, I mean, I'll, I'll I take I'll that. take your real example there. Because I mean, here's the thing: like, if you ask me now, whether like I take ownership for some potential, you know, more murderous self, the answer might be no right now. Yeah. But actually embodying that mechanism, yes, I'm gonna take ownership of that mechanism. Like, like I, I think there are several different parts of the mechanism ownership where it's like, I would still um, subjectively view myself agentically. I, I still would, yeah. e even though I, even though I can recognize yes, yes. that there's, but because the thing is like, I have a question. I mean, what, I mean, I mean, I mean like we change throughout our lives. Right. And that would be an abrupt change. Of course. 
but I'm going to accept the changes in my personality and in my mechanism. And even if I got into a car crash, you know, like, like you just described where something changed about me, I would recognize that there was a physical change, but I would still view myself agentically. Cause I mean, how yes. would I view myself otherwise? You know, I mean, it's just kind of, we naturally have that view of ourselves <laughs> agentically. So I thought that this was the very kind of reductio that you had initially raised against merely subjective ownership. Is it, because- it, it, it is, but the thing is, would I still take ownership? I don't, because the thing is, what we talked about was um, whether these two criteria could constitute, you know, this semi-compatibilistic moral responsibility. Is it robust? Like, does this yes. actually constitute moral responsibility, a, a framework in which it obtains? No. No, I, I don't think so based on that second area where I don't okay. think mechanism ownership, the oh. subjectivity of it. Oh, you're I, saying I, you would accept the mechanism, but that it's not going to fit, the, the, the moral responsibility is not going to obtain? Yes. Yes. Oh. It, it, yes. So, I, okay. so, yeah. So I'm, I'm, saying, okay. I'm, saying, I'm saying I still would, okay. but, I, but I, I don't fundamentally think that that second okay. point, you, okay. know, do you, you understand what I, I'm saying? I, I disagree. Yeah. Le- I still disagree, but I disagree way less than Really? Me. You don't you don't think you would you would take response? Like, like, like for example- That I would like, accept it? You take ownership No, 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 no. Like, they, they know that, yeah, you, you would take ownership of- The mechanism. Because I'm actually surprised mm. by that. Because I'm not, I'm not no. saying- I don't think really. I would. Yeah. So- I, okay, let me. I have a follow up question to understand the gravity of what you're saying because I misunderstood it before. So I want to see if I'm getting it right now. Okay. Okay. Um, there's a so okay. So world alpha is the world we're currently in, world beta is the one after you get uh, into a car accident and have the device implanted, right? Sure. The propensity of action X, I don't care what it is, of you doing action X is slightly increased by the device. In world alpha, you live the rest of your life having that having never done that act but the increased propensity in in world beta makes you actually commit that act so there's an actualized difference between the two uh you okay so you you don't think that you are morally respond that moral responsibility obtains in the second sense but there's some way in which it's rational to accept the the difference in manifestation there that's what you're saying (laughs) Well, I, I'm not even sure it's rational to okay. accept You're to accept to accept any mechanism, um, you know, like, as we're not responsible for these mechanisms. Mm-hmm. But I'm just saying that you would. I mean, like, did, did you ever you suffer? A, okay. Did you ever suffer a concussion? Probably, like, but not diagnosed. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. And I, I noticed, like, that after I had done football, after I had suffered a, you know, never diagnosed, but I certainly mm-hmm. did suffer a concussion. I did stutter. A little fuzzy. Yeah. I, I had some stuttering issues. So, and there was never, I mean, there were points that I associated the concussion with the stutter, but never did I not take ownership for the stutter. For the rest of his life, he'd never, you know. Okay, can I ask a question then? Okay, so I have a God's eye view of this. And I tell you that time, that instance of stuttering, was a stutter that would not have occurred had you not gotten the concussion. Um, there's a sense in which I accept that that concussion or that stutter less. Now it's tough because I obviously would accept, you know, you and I probably got concussions wrestling and I accept, you know, like my second order desires a line. Like I wanted to wrestle. And I wanted to want to wrestle. Right. So, so it's tough because like you're accepting the means by which you acquired the stutter. Right. But sure. like, but, but there is, and, and that, and that really stacks the deck to be honest, but. But also I, I have to interject here because you yeah. gotta remember that it's subjective ownership. Mechanism. Yes, 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 yes. So, uh, I mean, mechanism ownership, subjective mechanism ownership. So I, so I'm talking about a subjective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, that's, that's so, the, you're, so even, even if you were to key. give me like a God's eye view and say that, you know, mm. Um, had this concussion not occurred, you yeah. would not be stuttering. I, I don't, I, I wouldn't be able to divorce, I think, like well, my feelings on the ownership of that. Okay, here's what from, I think you're getting at that I actually completely agree with. 
This subjective acceptance is clearly a necessary condition, but it's also clearly not a sufficient one. So in all situations in which you do not subjectively accept the mechanism, you can't be responsible, but merely knowing that you do accept it is not enough. Sure. There's gotta be. And, and the not enough is the part that I think that we think Fisher needs to develop more. Exactly. Or I know that I think, yeah, exactly. But I, I, I do believe it is necessary. Um, not sufficient and i honestly and i also think it's okay oh wait wait just just this this thought just occurred okay is that where okay is that where i'm trying to cram the like the character peg into then like the the coherence for the subjective acceptance across time where it's like you because it was in your character to wrestle and you were like yeah i know there's a risk of a concussion and stuttering that might occur from it and then, you know, you do get the concussion. There was some stuttering that, that resulted from it, but you still, that was still in your character and you still accepted it, right? And, and the reason why we find the case of just, you know, you go to sleep, a device is imp- implanted in your brain. It induces an action that you wouldn't have otherwise done. That's so jarring because of the stark discontinuity. So it's almost about like the rate of change or it's about the rate and the severity of the change and the source of the change. No, it could even be random for me. Like, I mean, I'm going to take ownership subjectively of some yeah. sort of, from a car crash. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but so, you... so it, it doesn't have to be like in character that I somehow um, had this stark discontinuity that, okay, well, it could be explained because you wanted to wrestle. And therefore, well, if, Giffen, am I capturing your views well? Because I know you and I are both. I mean, I just want to make sure you seem to be describing roughly kind of what I was intuiting. Um, I'm, I still... you feel the same way subjectively. No, right? Yeah. I'm trying to like, I was thinking of some more examples of instances where, cause like we gave the example of like a car crash being like a impetus for like a change, even if it's like a minor change. And Jordan, you were saying like the propensity to do the thing is actualized. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, the God comes down and tells you that, you know, can I, there would be a difference really quick. Can I ask a, just to, before we change examples, were, were you going to change examples? Yeah. I was going to give a separate example, can, right? Real quick before you do that. Yeah, Sure. Okay. If the car, okay. Let's say you're in a car crash and it wasn't your fault. Right. So let's not make it yeah. muddy. If your legs are like just mangled and paralyzed, right. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't subjectively own that change. Um, well, is that a mechanism it, difference? Well, when it comes to the ability for you to exercise guidance control over something like walking, yeah. Hmm. <clears throat> so, the I suddenly you can't make the car fly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. The Republicans give you a pass on this instance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but the but then suddenly, and that seems like it's an obvious case of one in which you wouldn't accept the the change subjective change in you wouldn't subjectively accept the change in mechanism. But then when it's your brain, it seems like you would descriptively have a higher likelihood to accept it. But I wonder if that's just because it's like, it's harder to kind of, I don't know. There, there's some difference there that I'm questioning the relevance so real quick, of. Yeah. I kind of view a mechanism as yourself, right? So I am my mechanism. Source of an Is action. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So you're l- Legs, your legs have now gone. Uh, they're, you can't use them anymore. Sure. Um, <laughs> so it, before your mechanism is, I can use my legs, I can walk around, I'm Brian, whatever. And then afterwards, your mechanism is, I can't use my legs. That's what's changed. So when you say accept, it sounds to me like you're just rejecting that your legs can't move no no or you're saying that's not jordan 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 has legs that can move that works. <laughs> this is not jordan okay i think my internet's really bad i think it, yeah. i think it's i think it's really bad and i, I don't think you own it's, that mechanism it's like really 
No. <laughs> I think I'm just going to listen for the rest of the discussion. Uh, that, that's honestly why we were smiling there for a second because, like, it was a crazy you, delay. Yeah, the, the delay, your, your yeah, voice didn't thought. match up with the video. So you should be kind of like <laughs> drifting to the side, but there would just be like <laughs> a just void, but a, just a smile on your face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no movement. A bad dub. <laughs> Yeah, it was like a bad over I've those like Japanese movies that like they just dub over it. Did not even try yeah. to change the. I, I've asc- <laughs> here, Brian, I've ascended with just this smile <laughs> as like as he projects his thoughts. Um, I I sort of lost our train of thought there. Brian had well, a point about um the crippled leg example and like whether or not yeah, you own the mechanism versus like yeah. accepting the change. Yeah. So I was pointing to like the, the legs were supposed to be an example in which I didn't have guidance control due to a loss of mechanism ownership. Um, because me now, I, I don't actually know all of the biology behind it, but I exercise guidance control over my legs. Right. I want to move my legs. I intend to move my legs. I move my legs. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, if I were in a car crash in which my spinal cord was, you know, destroyed, um, or I actually don't even that that is what would result in me being paralyzed. Right. Uh, my my ignorance of biology was showing there, but like sounds about right. Um, th- that is so I don't have guidance control in that scenario, but I wouldn't be tempted to subjectively accept the change in mechanism there. Oh, I actually am not sure if I am intuiting like the use of mechanism there. Cause yeah. I'm imagining like this, this is like relative to something. So like, yeah, you would like, for instance, like after you were paralyzed, you wouldn't like, if your legs moved in such a way that it like caused damage to someone else, like you accidentally like, not kick yeah like, like they like spasmed sort of, or whatever yeah, yeah right like yeah you could say like i no longer have that control but like the mechanism yeah. i don't but the mechanism has changed right so it's like before if my leg you know flies out and kicks yeah it's because i <laughs> it's yeah, because you jump I, and kick someone <laughs> yeah like i kicked you there but yeah. in in the one in which like you know my like just nerves fire right the mechanism yeah. has changed there and i wouldn't subjectively own that second mechanism but then it seems weird that like I would be tempted and, and I'm honestly bracket. So uh, we might be talking past each other in that Adam might be talking purely descriptively and I'm accidentally lapsing into normative discussions about this. I don't, frankly, I just don't know. Like you can stipulate that I would descriptively accept a neural change in mechanism, right? Because maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't, but I just, I don't think that it is, it's weird to, this is why I think that it's a sufficient but not necessary condition, because even if I would accept it, um, it doesn't seem to me like that gives a lot of power because it could be resultant from something that's just totally, you know, in the same way that the in the same way that the loss of leg function is. And maybe Adam and I actually aren't disagreeing at all. Maybe I've just understood now kind of the totality of what I'm thinking. I don't think we do, but just going off your example there real fast, I actually don't view it too differently from the piano example, actually, where, where it's like, you know, if you have the intention to walk to me, that's almost like in a sense, you have the capacity to walk, but you can't exercise that capacity to walk considering yes. you're, yes. you have a spinal injury. So yes. yeah. it's almost as that's, though, yeah. so in, in the same way of like, you know, the piano, the hands being chained, like you have and the it, capacity, but oh, you, know, you can't exercise the hands that capacity. stay chained. That's, that's and this yeah, is exactly. what, so oh, I, I, I view it okay, as very okay. similar. But you would still have so, a mechanism for which like for other actions, you know, you and, still and, own. and even if you didn't subjectively own a mechanism, but you still succumbed in the case of a, you know, a bad outcome to that example over and over again, that is a perfect example of what this is like kind of the thing I was harping on. The first part of the series is about like evaluations of character that that seems like a pristine example in which you're not morally responsible, but we can make important evaluations about the type of person you are. 
right? Like this person is a person who can't play the piano or has legs that spasm. So don't stand too close to them or can't help himself, but eat a donut or in the case of Charles Whitman, you know, murder. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, or Robert Harris from the one that we actually read. Um, So it seems like, yeah, those distinctions in character evaluations can remain also, I think I think Frankfurt's well invoked in your example as well. Yeah. In, in, oh, in, yeah. In, like like in like in the sense that you might have like a second order volition to walk, like you really want to want to walk. <laughs> yes. You know. Yes, you know what you I mean? So. Yeah. You know, yeah. but. Um, and guidance control in Frankfurt's uh, view would just be the ability to sort of exercise your first order desires. That would be how he would view guidance control, right? Yeah, actually, now I'm thinking about my example, the real fast actually doesn't make as much sense considering, I mean, if you were truly bedridden, would you want to want to walk? <laughs> you might not actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you might want to just have yeah. that desire to see. Yeah, 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 you might not want to want to walk. That's true. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I, either way, it's like, um, you, know, you can imagine you're recovered perfectly fine, you know, a couple of days later or something. Yeah. yeah, but like perhaps like you know you weep in bed because you want to walk, but you don't want to want to walk hmm. because you can't. The so, wanting to want to walk, the wanting to walk because it's just suffering. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. It's almost, painful. Yeah, exactly. So it's almost like you know you're not you're, re- you're not responsible for the manifestation of that behavior at that point based <laughs> on the wanting to walk because you don't want to want to walk. You know, and you want that to be actionable because wanting to walk only causes you pain. Yeah. So I, I, I do like that framework still for evaluating yeah. situations like that. I don't know if we've answered <laughs> def- <laughs> definitively any questions in my mind, but I think that we've definitely, I think we've definitely raised very good, at least, co- I think more of my intuitions cohere than they previously did maybe M- maybe maybe but maybe some actually are more disparate than they ever were i don't know <laughs> I, I think i yeah i i i want to kind of simmer on some of this stuff and moving tangentially away with the wolf paper might be a good way to do that so we might move slightly off although like i said i don't actually know the, the complete depth of that paper so Let's move to that paper because I might, I might, it might be one of those examples where being away from a specific kind of part of the literature makes me kind of cohere my what I think about it a little bit more. Um, okay, See the forest for the trees. Yeah, I'm I'm up in the trees right now for sure, for sure. With, <laughs> yeah, with let's step stuff. back. Okay, nice. All right, well, uh, that'll do it for this episode then. Um, I hope listeners enjoyed this, uh, even if it was just <laughs> this. This episode, more than most, was seeing how much intuitions could cohere. <laughs> but but I think it's good though, because I think it's good because hopefully listeners were kind of getting primed along the way themselves. So, um, all right, tune in next time for uh, for more moral responsibility. <laughs> <laughs>